Y'all planning for this? Welcome back, TPR Nation. This is Jamie Shalanskin, an episode of Worlds to Conquer, and do I have a story for you today. Have you ever noticed in your life that there are so many people constantly willing to give you advice on a subject they have little to no information on, but nobody actually helps? Like, they have an opinion. They want to give you advice on how you should do something, but they either haven't done it themselves they are limited in their scope, like they're only seeing part of the picture, or they're not actually willing to do anything about it to like actually jump in and help you. So let me tell you about a little occurrence that happened recently. And this is something that could happen to anyone. It happened to us randomly. So we were on holiday, all of the Shalanskis, uh, we live up in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, my dad and mom came up to Alaska in the 1970s. Uh, my dad uh, drove up the Alcan with a full grin on his face, just absolutely enamored with the last frontier. It is truly to this day the last frontier. It is an incredible country to visit. If you don't have an opportunity to do so, make it a point to make an opportunity to come to Alaska, especially if you're an American citizen. I tell everybody that Alaska is the coolest place as a citizen that we can experience without even needing a passport. It's in our own backyard and it is phenomenal. So he came up, he was grinning ear to ear. My mom was crying the entire time. Um, having grown up in Hawaii, she is definitely a sun baby. He fell in love and she just felt it was just awful. It was cold. It was dark. It was gray. It was miserable and all the things that she didn't want it to be. Alas, my dad raised us as little frontier babies and we love it. We absolutely love the state. And so now, you know, we're there. All the grandkids are there. So my mom is forever tethered to it. So every January we make a migration. We come back to Hawaii. It's like a second home for all of us. And um, because my dad raised us as little frontier babies, we've got a lot of knowledge about survival situations. And we even as a family, we'll take classes on survival situations and to get advanced training on different different subjects. And we always talk to the kids about the level of preparedness. So my father's an Eagle Scout. My baby brother, Micah Shalansky, is an Eagle Scout. And we always try to be prepared for different situations. Uh, so there we were in Hawaii and uh, we decided to uh, rent out a private charter boat. We we're going to Molokini Island. Gabe and Lana, my niece and nephew, they're old enough now to get their scuba certification and their regular scuba certification. So we went out there. Micah, my dad and I are already certified. Uh, Floyd's a master diver. Micah's a rescue diver and I'm a leisure diver. And we jumped in the water. We went on a little exploration of the crater. Super cool experience. While the kids pounded out the rest of the sea card so they could get their designations. Great dive. Had a phenomenal experience. Two tanks. Uh, great weather. Small current when we did the first dive. Strong current when we did the second dive. So as we came back in on the water, it was getting uh, choppier and choppier. The surf was pretty high. And if you've been to Kihei in Hawaii on the island of Maui, you'll know that the boat harbor is particularly small. So you can only... Uh, it's only there to get two boats in and out. So there's only room for two trailers. And they built a rock wall to keep the surf at bay. But on this particular day, because it was so choppy, the water was coming up over the wall. I mean, just giant waves. So we really had to time our entry and exit. And for some reason, in the last year, they've allowed the surfers to pick up the surf right there. And so it's just this incredibly dangerous 100 feet of space where you've got boats trying to get in and out of the harbor. and. 30 different surfers on the same path for the entry and the exit. It's the stupidest situation. I would never surf there. You got an entire island. Why would you choose where boats are coming in and out? So we got out successfully, navigated around the surfers. We came back in and our captain was watching the surf. We were kind of, you know, hanging out in the water for a couple of minutes, kind of looking behind us, making sure where the wave's at. He's like, everyone looks at the harbor to approach their entry. You should be looking behind you at the sea uh, because that's going to tell you where the biggest waves are coming. So he's watching it. He's doing really well. We time our um, entry and we just, I mean, just soft as butter. We just land in that harbor, rode the wave, soft as butter, turned into the harbor, no problem. We are throwing the lines to dock up at the harbor there and I'm watching the surf where the surfers are and there's like a 19 foot, it's not a low, but it was a little fishing boat. 
And this 19 little runabout fishing boat was coming in. And the captain of this boat, there were two men on board. The captain of this boat had rowed the wave in, but as soon as he was on top of the wave, he immediately turned it to the right in order to go into the harbor instead of waiting for the wave to bring him down. So when he did this, all the water from that wave that he was on top of went in his boat. I don't know how it didn't capsize it, but he definitely took on, I mean, all of this water. And so he took on so much water that the engines were underneath and he couldn't get him to start. So he began to crash towards the rocks. Now, the bilge pumps kicked on. They started doing what they were supposed to do. They were dumping tons of water out to the side. One engine fired up because he was running twin 50s and one engine fired up, but the other one was completely submerged. And at this time, we can see that there's two men still on board, so they're both safe. But both of them, I mean, the captain's trying to get trying to get the engine cut up, cut up, cut up, cut up, can't get it to go. Kind of got the one engine to putter around to get him off of the rock. So now he's at least in the harbor and off of the rocks. But as I'm drawing the attention, I tell our captain, I said, hey, listen, that boat's going to capsize. I was like, it took on a lot of surf. And he's like, well, the bilge pumps are, and we're kind of assessing the situation because the very first thing that you don't want to do, and by this time, the boat is half underwater, half on top. and But the bilge pumps are, are pumping out water tons. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to rush over there immediately. You don't want to jump in the water. You don't want to try to go and immediately start saving people or things because you can put yourself in immediate danger. So you need to first pause, assess what's going going on. So our first responsibility in that situation was all of us. I, you know, I looked at my brother, Micah, and I said, hey, confirming two souls on board. And he said, yep, two souls on board. And so we all knew how many people were in that boat. Why? Because you can't always see kids. You can't always see kids and somebody could have been hidden. Somebody could have been taking a nap and not paying attention. Somebody could have been knocked out when they ended up getting into that surf really well. So we confirmed the exact same thing, two souls on board and we go around. And then um, as it's taking on water, we didn't rush into the water. So Micah is the lifeguard rescue diver. I'm a darn good swimmer, um, Floyd the master diver. And we didn't rush over there because we wanted to kind of assess the situation, make sure the men were still conscious. And the whole time, so once the boat started to go underwater, we saw two heads bob up, two souls, two souls, confirming I see two souls. At one point, we lost one. We were like, hey, is anyone second second man? And so we kept confirming we could see everyone. And we're trying to talk to these people in the boat. You know, they're not terribly far from us, you know, probably 200 feet or so. And we're like, um, can you swim? Can you leave the boat? Do you have a life raft? We're asking these very simple questions. Here's what's not happening. We don't have a thousand people asking the same question. We have the loudest, strongest voice asking this question. But here's what we couldn't plan for. They weren't responding to us. They were looking at us, eyes beseeching for help, but they were holding onto the boat and they weren't responding. Now, they weren't in jeopardy. Everyone looked safe. Everyone looked good. Nobody was hurt. There was no blood or anything like that. So as the boat starts to submerge, and at this time, it's, you know, halfway upside down. And as it begins to take on water, what will happen with the boat is it will flip. So it will completely capsize and go upside down. So the bottom of the boat's now floating on top. And these men are still clinging to this boat. The shore is 200 feet away, but they're desperately clinging to this boat. And the entire time that we're trying to communicate with them, they will not let the boat go. They will not. So either they cannot swim, which is hard to believe as a captain, but in most states, you don't have to have any qualifications in order to drive a boat. So either they cannot swim, they were doing something they shouldn't have been and trying to get their boat back. It's not their boat and they feel dangerous, you know, uh, leaving it out there. Or as Micah pointed out, it could have been their sources of income. I mean, they had chest freezers full of fish. That might have been their livelihood. And when we get in those situations of survival, we're not wanting to let it go. So what we ended up doing was we jumped back on our boat, which is a much bigger vessel. We tied a line to it. We drug it closer to the docks. Uh, once it was near the docks, we had about a 50-foot liter rope on it. And this is the part that I was just in absolute shock about because it just, it never ceases to amaze me. And a few times we've been in situations like this. So at this point, the stuff is starting to drift up on shore. And so I grab my nephew and luckily my sister-in-law, Kelly, she was very responsive too, following my lead. And we start grabbing their coolers. We start grabbing their personal effects out of the water and putting them up on the beach for these individuals because we have more than enough hands that are working on the boat and the people. So now I want people off of the dock. And so I am ushering people off of the dock. We're moving our gear. We are saying, okay, 
okay, you sit here. Kelly was on the phone with 911. We, you know, my nephew and niece and I were grabbing stuff. And our good friend Tracy, who was with us, she was helping grab stuff too. And so we were like, you do this, you do this, confirm that you've done this. And so we're, we're delegating orders in a way that are clear, they're direct, and everyone knows what the other one is supposed to do. We're not huddling around the situation unless our hands are actively helping. So as I'm moving people off the dock, because now you have all these gawkers coming in. And so I'm moving people off the dock. And these two men come on the dock and they're probably in their early 60s. And as our boat is moving out of the water to go out to the other boat and help, this gentleman says, it's about time. It's about time you're about to help them. How could you not help them? Why is this taking you so long to help those people? You need to go help those people. Now, this man could have also jumped in the water and tried to render aid, but instead he continued as we are actively trying to shove off one boat and tie the other one up and bring it closer. And we are, all of us are in unison. We're uh, giving orders. We're getting life preservers. I mean, everyone is orchestrated and working the way that they should be that are hands on. This man is so boisterously coming around to everyone actively working and saying, uh, why did it take you so long to respond? Why weren't you doing these things? What? And now, mind you, prior to this, he had been a thousand feet away on top in the parking lot and he had to walk all the way down to the scene. He had to walk all the way on the dock and then he had to come to all of us and docks aren't big. And so the dock was the plank, the walkway for us was only probably four feet wide, if that. And so he's walking up on all of us that have got ropes and things and we're pulling and he's standing there asking us why we didn't respond faster, why we didn't help sooner, why we didn't save this boat from capsizing when we could have. We're telling him, sir, you know, we've got the situation on our hand. Could you please stand back? Sir, could you, you know, uh, either grab a grab a line, grab part of the rope and help, or you need to move back. And he won't stop. He keeps questioning why something wasn't done sooner. Now, one, that wasn't the time, that wasn't the place. And here's the big ticker. He had no freaking idea of what was going on prior to that. He made a lot of assumptions. And when he was standing a thousand feet away and saw us staring at this boat, saw this boat take on on water and capsize, he made all of the assumptions in the world that we were doing nothing. When at that time, we were trying to assess the situation, communicate with those on board, coming up with a plan of what we're going to do if they could, if they didn't swim away from that boat. Now, had we jumped in that water, would we have been able to flip a boat? No, no, we could not have flipped a boat even when we were dragging it back to shore. It's probably the heaviest thing that I ever helped drag. We were never, ever going to drag it up on shore. We were just trying to get it close enough that we could use one of the cleats to tie it off so we could bring a fire truck or heavy equipment down in order to drag that boat onto shore. We was no chance we were gonna do that physically by hand. It was too big of a boat. It was a few thousand pounds. Plus it was completely waterlogged and upside down. So now it's dragging on the floor. But instead of rendering any type of aid, he just had criticisms. He didn't have any advice. He just wanted to tell us what we should have done, but what he failed in his circumstances to do. Now you can say, well, this guy didn't have a boat. Okay, well, then why are you showing up to this party in the first place? Well, the, and he had no plan. He had no sense of uh, direction. He had no gumption to actually be hands-on. And, and instead, what we ended up having to do was the guys had to uh, yell at him and say, sir, you need to get off of this boat. You can take this up with us tomorrow and you can talk to us all the all tomorrow about all of your critiques. But today you got to get off of this plank. You got to get off of this. You got to back up. You are now in the way. And it took us being aggressive to get this guy. Now, as this is happening, we've got hundreds of people now showing up along the shoreline and everyone's watching this spectacle. But nobody except for our family was on their phone. There was only one person, and that was my sister-in-law, calling 911 to report the incident. We were already on the radio with the Coast Guard informing them what was happening on the boat. So we were already radioed the Coast Guard as soon as we say it, we saw it took on water and the village pump was not working sufficiently enough to be able to turn the boat back over. Now, also, there's this ton of stuff washing up to shore. Nobody was grabbing that stuff except for our family, even though there were hundreds of people. And so when we think about this incredibly dramatic situation of what happened, as soon as it got done, what we did as a family was we regrouped in a separate spot. And we said, hold on, everyone stop. 
what's the checklist? Everyone, because we had all of our dive gear, right? And so everything had been kind of like spread around, you know, where's the car keys? Where are these things? You know, et cetera. And so we stopped and individually, even if it was my own gear, I'd go up to my nephew. Hey, do you have your mask? Do you have your flippers? Do you have your BCD? Do you have this? Do you have, and he and went through the five things. And I said, yes. I said, okay, great. Now go to the next person, confirm that. And then the, the, ended coming back to me. So even though I had given the checklist, I still needed somebody to go through the checklist with me to make sure I had all of my dive gear. Now, these gentlemen ended up being physically fine, but they were so scared in that situation, they didn't know how to react and they didn't know how to communicate. And so if you study a lot of fight or flight responses, you'll know that when that amygdala gets hijacked, and this happens a lot with kids, So have you ever been so upset with your kids and they come in and you're like, why did you do that? What happened? Why did this happen this way? And you start raising your voice, you start yelling at them, you start using your fingers to point and the kids are like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And you're like, oh my God, did I raise an idiot? How do you not know? How do you not know? And the more that you get upset about this, the more their amygdala is putting them into a fight or flight response and they cannot verbalize what they need to say to you because now they're in survival mode. And just like in that situation with the boat, we were asking them questions, but they couldn't respond. They either, they had no idea how to respond to us because that situation had put them in such a fright or flight situation. They didn't know what to do. They couldn't even verbalize what was happening at that moment. And they couldn't react. They didn't know to just leave the boat and get themselves safely to shore. It wasn't happening. They weren't doing it. We had to physically try to pry. And one of the guys, the captain, he never left the boat. He, even though it was upside down, he would he just kept using his body to pry and pry and pry and try to get the boat closer to shorelines. So we look at situations like that. And then afterwards, we gathered all our stuff. We went through the checklist, make sure nobody was missing anything because there's a lot of activity and things are flying around. And then the second thing that we did was we, Micah pulled the kids in and we did an after action. In the after action, he was working with the kids and his wife and he said, okay, let's go through that situation. What went wrong? What happened? And why did it happen that way? And as he was debriefing, as he's going through that, he said, okay, what was thing number one? One, they should have left the boat. They were close enough to shore. They should have swam. They should put themselves in danger by not leaving that boat as it was capsizing. Um, they could have been drug under. They could have got caught on something. There was a lot of things floating around. Something could have hit them in their head because the waves are still coming up and down. So one, it's just stuff. You're human. You leave You leave the situation. Get yourself away from danger. It's just stuff. Two, okay, let's say that you couldn't do that. Everyone who was offering a critique on the shoreline said we should have jumped in the water and done what? What should we have done? If we had swam over to a capsizing boat, what did we now do? We put ourselves in immediate risk of getting drug under also. So you can't just jump into the water. You have to assess what is happening and also what's about to happen. So that boat was too far. Like there's nothing us undocking and going over that boat would have saved it from faster. Instead, it would have put all of us on our boat at risk. So, all right, now I've got to look at it and say, all right, we've got to save these people understandably, but is it our responsibility to save this boat? And can we save this boat? Now, had we had an opportunity where we could have saved the boat, we would have. But when a boat is half full of water, there's nothing from inside of the water bobbing up and down we're going to be able to do except for to get those human lives, those souls off board. Three floaters, right? It took several times for people to say, should I throw the life preservers into the water? Yes, Yes, throw them in the water. Why? Because at some point, somebody's going to jump in and they're going to need those life preservers. So those should have automatically gone in the water. It took a couple of minutes, but once we were water bound, we did that. Now, here's the reason, even though I just told you that Floyd and Mike are great divers, plus we had the captain of our own boat, the rescue crews, as far as they goes, those women did amazing, uh, Dana and Christina. They did phenomenal. They jumped in the water also and uh, were, were helping in this situation. And when the life preservers are also necessary because you don't know if those people are going to going to take you out. So it's really, really hard when you're swimming up to somebody in order not to be taken out also. And then as we're doing this debrief, we said, what did we not see? What we didn't see was anyone else willing to help. But what did we see? We saw a lot of people telling us what should have happened. Now, we were the very first ones there, our family. We were the ones that saw the boat take on water. We saw it flip. We saw the whole thing. And we were the ones interactive. As we moved off of the dock and more people came to watch the situation, people were coming up to us 
telling us what happened. And what's interesting about that is they didn't see it, number one. They didn't know we were a part of it, but they were telling us with such sense of authority of what happened and those details were inaccurate. What they were telling us had happened wasn't what actually happened. And I'm telling you this story because it really illustrates how many times in our lives people show up to give us gospel advice, but they have no real world experience in it. They weren't there. They weren't part of the conversation. They didn't see it. So number one, when you're approaching a situation, learning about the amygdala, learning about responses and how you're going to react makes you prepared for those situations. The brain, you know, I shared with you, it's lazy, but its go-to clutch is to pull out information that was previously stored. And so a lot of those people on the shoreline, they might have never taken a rescue class. They might have never, you know, been scuba certified. They maybe are not lifeguards. Maybe they didn't go through any survival training. Maybe they haven't watched Coast Guard movies. Whatever the situation is, they didn't have enough prior knowledge for the brain to tell them what they should be doing. What they should be doing, number one, radio the Coast Guard. Number two, let's get 911 on the phone. Number three, making sure we're confirming how many people are on board that ship. Number four, get the life preservers in the water. Number five, clear unnecessary people from the situation. Anyone unnecessary, anyone not willing willing to render aid needs to leave. They need to step back and let everyone else work. Because if you're not, you're putting now everyone else in danger. And so when we look at those situations, I mean, think about, I mean, this is, you know, a dramatic illustration, but think about your company meetings. You know, how many times do we have, you know, a situation happen and we start pulling people into it that really shouldn't be involved. If they're not rendering aid, if they're not directly involved in it, if they're not a stakeholder, they need to go because they're not providing assistance at the moment you need assistance. Now they're taking up congestion and that's problematic because now you're not going to come to a solution and now they're putting everybody else in jeopardy or now we're not able to achieve those goals as we inch closer. All right. Second thing is looking around and giving direct orders. You call 911, tell them X, making eye contact with people, making sure people clearly and effectively understand the mission. This is exactly what I need you to do. One of the things that we do in our companies, it was we don't say, okay, we are going to call. They are going to respond. Let's let us get this together. No, that's those aren't nouns. We need proper nouns. We need proper nouns. You know, if it's going to be Charnel's going to do this, Clarice is going to do that, Kelly Gunn is going to get back to me on. We put names because anytime we hide behind the anonymity of saying they, we, us, you, someone, it's no one. It's no one. Say what you have to say and use the person's name because that's critical in knowing who's responsible for the task, who's expected to get things done. How many times have you said, hey, we need to or order more copier paper. And then you show up and there's no more copier paper. Well, I thought so-and-so was going to do that. Oh, isn't that what such and such normally does? And then all of a sudden it goes in this loop. Instead, we say, no, you, you specifically do this. Okay, great. Thanks. I'll get it done. And then just like in that trauma situation, call 911, tell them this. And we're making eye contact. The person understands the mission. They can execute on the action and we're moving forward. And then we're going through that checklist. What all has to be done now? All right, great. What now are we looking ahead and seeing what else needs to happen and putting people in place to do those things and shoving out the people that don't and shouldn't have a voice in this scenario. Somebody sitting at the dock loudly telling us what should have done when they weren't a part of the conversation, 0% helpful. And how many times in your life when you're going through something, when you're dealing with something, somebody is telling you how you should handle it. Uh, One of the things that drive me nuts is somebody telling me how to do something when they have, they're not a stakeholder, they have no involvement, and they've never done it. And think about this, a lot of you entrepreneurs, you might relate to this one. And thankfully, this is not my spouse because we'd have some very strong words if it was. But one of the leaders in the organization I work with, when they're explaining what's going on, so they're like, oh, I'm so frustrated because a lot of times with our spouses and our loved ones, we don't share the highlight reels, we share with them our frustrations. And so we do it to the point that we are like venting and we're talking about it because we can't have those kind of frank conversations with the team members that we want to, but we can with our 
Jewish spouse. And we're like, oh my God, they drive me nuts because da 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 da. And so then all of a sudden, you know, our spouse might take a position. And this happened to uh, one of my female leaders in our organization. She was doing a lot of venting to her husband. And her husband works in a completely different field, but is a manager of that field in a different industry. And he was telling her what she should do. And she was like, oh, it's so and so. Well, you should do this again. You should do that. If I was there, I would tell them this and I would handle it this way. And then I would do that. And so they were offering advice to this female leader. He was offering advice that he had no experience in. He didn't really understand. He was just hearing the the frustrations. And he wasn't also getting to see all the positives, all the highlights, all the successes of that other team member. Instead, he was just hearing all the negative stuff and rendering advice based on that. And so at that point, you know, I was talking to her and she was like, I'm really frustrated because he keeps telling me da 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 And I don't want to hear that because he also doesn't understand X, Y, and Z. And I was like, well, that's kind of your responsibility, right? You shared all of that information with him. So now he feels he has a voice in how you should be making actions. And especially if it's giving advice on whether or not to hire or fire someone, if you're not a stakeholder, you got to take a seat, shut up. You got to listen, let people vent, but you don't get to offer an opinion necessarily because you're only seeing a glimpse of what is actually happening. It needs to be that individual. And so if you're an entrepreneur or solo practitioner out there, make sure that when you're sharing your frustrations with other people and they start giving you advice, is that the kind of advice you should be listening to? Is it balanced? Is it judgment-free? Has this person also seen the positive aspects, not just the negative ones? Have, do they have a clear picture? Like the guy on the dock, he had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, but that didn't mean he wasn't authoritatively trying to tell us otherwise. So do does everyone see what they need to be seeing in order to make a plan that best suits what the situation is? And then that debrief, That after action of being able to come together and say, hey, this is what transpired. What did you see? What did you not see? And this is the importance of it. And we do this across all brands and all organizations and companies that I'm involved in. And we grabbed this right out of the military. One guy that we hired, it didn't work out. He didn't end up um, being with us long term, but I really liked this guy. And his name is Nolan. He had great advice for us. You know, he's so proactive. And he said, you know, um, in the military, when we got done with the mission, we'd always do an after action report. Have you guys ever considered doing that? And so he must have told us a decade ago. And I said, brilliant, of course, because when do you have the most knowledge of a situation? Immediately after it, immediately after it. And so we would debrief and do an after action anytime something happened, good or bad, so we can make what other adjustments that we wanted to. So here's how we use it in our advisory practices. When we do a webinar, when we do a seminar, when we do a search, when we have a critical system update or incident that happens, if we have a compliance issue that comes up, if we have a giant success with a team member or a client, we will do an after action and say, hey, what did we, what actions did we take? What was the goal of this? What was our response time? Okay, great. Now, how do we do it? We had this recently happen in an organization where they have an interface portal and it went down. And so there's a system-wide issue that impacted daily business for about eight hours. And, and during that eight-hour period, because it happened overnight, only five people were impacted. So it had it been six people, had it been more than five, then we would have done a system wide notice to everyone because those were just the ones that told us about it. Less than five, we make phone calls. We do an immediate after action. How did it happen? Why did it happen? How long did it happen for? What was our response time? What was the response to the responses we gave? And then that lives in our compliance file, especially in your advisory practice. This is something you really need to do, especially when it comes to like disaster recovery plans. So each of us in the financial advisory world, we're required to have a disaster recovery plan. And we are required to know what those incidences are. And it's a system-wide disruption. If we have a disruption to our business that lasts longer than X, Y, and Z timeframe, then we have disaster recovery. And so disasters often make us think of like massive snowstorms, earthquakes, those kind of like catastrophic acts of God. But people don't realize a disaster is, is a cell tower that goes down or you lose internet for 24 hours. Those are also disasters because why? Because they are system operational distractions to business. They shut your business down. Now you don't have the ability to operate in the capacity that you should be. 
And so when that happens, we have to do, we have got our policies and procedures all outlined for what has to take place. Uh, one of the things we do in the Shalanskis, because uh, we like to have a little fun in our advisory practice, is we will randomly, the leadership team, pick a day on the calendar and we will emulate a disaster in our office. And we will normally, I try to give my team at least a little heads up. So six months prior, I will have updated the disaster recovery plan. I will have circulated to all team members. I will ask them verbally throughout the months if they have read it, they had any questions, et cetera. And it all goes documented in their personnel file. And then six months later, we'll do a scheduled on the leadership's team disaster recovery day. So this is look like uh, Micah going through the office with a megaphone saying everything is shut down, you know, this is an earthquake, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then our team members must go through the disaster recovery. And uh, what we'll do is we'll stage ourselves. The last time we did it, I grabbed my mom and we staged ourselves at our first offsite location. And we had prizes for the first person that showed up on our offsite location. And uh, it was very funny because the person who showed showed up first was the one we did not expect to show up first. And so Clarice ended up winning the disaster recovery award because she said, no, we had a disaster recovery. This is the next point of contact. I already did X, Y, and Z. And then she had to get herself operational. And so because we have a hybrid office and we have people all around the country, only the people in our physical office knew we were going through this drill, but they had to notify everybody else. They had to transfer our phone systems. They had to reroute our emails. They had to do all of these different steps. And we sat there with a stopwatch and when took notes on who showed up, who did what, who was the point of contact, how long did it take them to respond, you know, and did all of these things. And then who showed up last? Who went to the wrong location? Who didn't even know that there was a location and was two hours late because they went home and thought that it was just a just an in-service day or something. So we did all of this. And then as the day concluded, we did our after action report and we took notes and we said, okay, who was prepared? Who was not prepared? Who knew what the assignment was and who didn't? That's really what this was and brought the team together and said, hey, if we have this occur again, here's what's going to happen. Now we did this in 2017. In that situation, we ran a drill because we'll do it every couple of years. And and then we did every documentation. We let our compliance officer know. We put it in file. Well, in November of 2018, Alaska had a massive earthquake. And we did have system-wide disruptions. And when we had that massive earthquake, we were all at a tax conference in Las Vegas at Shalansky's. And when it occurred, our team immediately went into action and followed the disaster recovery plan to a T. How and why did that happen? Because we had done these drills with them. Because we had done these drills, they knew what the assignment was and they knew what they were supposed to be doing in those situations. And I was so impressed and excited because the brain, like I said, if you didn't have any prior knowledge, if the brain doesn't have a resource to pull from, it doesn't. And so instead, it just sits there and waits and you go into this flight or fight response instead of knowing what it needed to do. So we had this giant earthquake. Our team went through this thing like a checklist in their mind. They didn't even need to pull up the document. And it was fantastic. I was so, so impressed with them. And that's why I tell everyone every day of the week, I can take my team anywhere in the world and they are phenomenal. Not because they are perfect, but because we try. We put the energy in. We put the effort into. How many of you, and I want to know, like, an actual number. You need to email me at lifestyletheperfectra.com or tag me in social media. How many of you actually have done a disaster recovery simulation in your office? Not, I thought about doing this, not a disaster occurred and we responded, but how many of you are doing perfect practice? How many of you are taking these policies, taking these regulations, taking the way that we're supposed to run our business and practicing it throughout the year, making sure your team is equipped to know what they need to do when the time comes. And you're thinking, oh, but you know, you have a much larger office, I'm sure. No, if you have a small office, you for sure need to go through this drill. Because the very first time that we did it as a team, guess what we discovered? We discovered all the things we couldn't do. Like we couldn't, nobody had, oh, this was one, this was hilarious. Okay, do you know what we forgot to include in our disaster recovery plan? 
we said to contact the custodian. There's a step in there that says contact the custodian. But in the drill we were running, none of us had electricity. And so we didn't have a power resource and we didn't have internet. So we couldn't look anything up and none of our computer devices were going to work. So it said to contact the custodian immediately is one of the steps. Nobody had the custodian's phone number written down and it wasn't in our disaster recovery plan book. Nobody had it. So with the, because we used our work phones at work and those were gone because we didn't have any electricity and nobody could look it up on the internet because we weren't supposed to have internet. So nobody had their phone programmed with the number written down. Nobody had it on a piece of paper in their office. Nobody had it in the disaster recovery plan book that's, that's hanging up in our office. Nobody had that information. So we couldn't contact the custodian. So that was one of the most immediate things that we were like, wow, that was really, and we missed it as leaders. We missed it. I wrote the damn book and I said, contact the custodian. Um, but I didn't think to put the contact information for the custodian because we are so dependent on the access to our technology. We're so dependent on our access to our technology that if you don't have electricity and you don't have internet, you come to a screeching halt pretty gosh darn quick. So I want to know how many of you are out there actually doing these drills. If you end up listening to this podcast and you're like, you know what, that would actually be kind of fun and useful. Let's make it happen for our office. Tell me how you did it. We've done simulated earthquakes. We did a fire. We did a tsunami because we live in Alaska near the ocean. You got to tell me how it happens. So simulate this situation. Uh, It's really a fun way to do compliance training in your office. At first, people find it really annoying. But then at the end of the day, because we end up buying lunch and drinks and then uh, doing an after action report, what worked, what did and we do prizes for the people that got on board or not, the lesson stuck. It stuck so well that when a real disaster occurred and we had that earthquake and a loss of power and a loss of internet, our team flew into action because the brain operates off of memory. The brain operates off of memory. If you don't, if you're in a brand new situation, you don't know what to expect, but it's pulling resources. It's constantly pulling resources and telling you what you should expect and what you should do. And that is why practice is so important. That's why debriefing, having after actions, having policies, going through it, practicing those steps over and over again can really save your bacon when you need it to. TPR Nation, we're all about action items in this podcast. We don't just sit here and proliferate all the things we think you should be doing. We tell you real advice. Number one, I'm a big fan of going through, especially with your family. I know this is family advice, not business advice, but especially with your family, what's the protocol? What's the do you do you have like a company? passphrase. We have that in our family that Mike and I still remember because in the 80s, we always learned that every stranger was going to kidnap you. And so you'd have this passphrase that a person would say, if indeed my mom or father sent a stranger to come and get us. So do we have that? Do we know what's the next point of action if the disaster goes out? In Alaska, we have one highway in and out of the city. All right, if you can't get on the highway, what's the backup plan? Where are we meeting at? Who's got survival gear? We love to go through that. What is the communication policy? That's number one. You get to new situation, a disaster occurs, the very, very first thing you do is set up a comm policy, communication policy, and making sure everyone in the family knows it. If you've got little kids and they know how to operate your iPhone and they know how to touch somebody's face or name, they might not have a phone number memorized. What phone numbers do they need to have memorized if they have to actually dial it because they don't have your phone and they have a stranger's phone and they're trying to find you? So these type of things are really important. Second one is the disaster recovery for your office. Run these simulation drills. Let me know if they worked for you and what you discovered when you went through them. Find a way to incorporate compliance that makes it entertaining, fun, and real life so that those lessons can stick. And then three, I want you to be hypercritical of people that show up on your dock to provide advice and have no idea what the situation at hand really is or what you have or have not already been doing. Those people are toxic and they need to be walked right off of your dock. TPR Nation, this is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. Go find people who share your values and change the world. isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. Information designed to change lives. Financial
financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. The perfect RIA.